the Uhuru welcome to Kalambayi and the Nick. Uhuru. sisters and brothers. Um, I have spoke at a lot of different places in the last three years around um, you know, black power, but by far this tour is not easy, by no means, um, to stand before my people and continue to pick at my heart with the science of African internationalists and say, what is it going to take to shake our people to understand that enough is enough? that babies are dying. Literally, mothers are sitting on the front pools of churches with their baby land stretched in front of them, knowing that that's the last time they're gonna see them. That no more crying, no more laughing, nothing. And all for a reason, like something that we can identify. The core contradiction of what we're talking about here is colonialism. It's not racism. It's not that these cops need sensitivity training. It's not that these cops need, um, you know, we need some body cameras. That's not going to change anything. Because the truth of the matter is, it was body cameras out there that day. You know, like, it was cameras in the cars. It was a helicopter in the sky the night that this happened. But still, it was so many lies that they told. First, they said that the girl stole a car. But nobody reported a car stolen. Nobody took out the time to say, why was they in the car in the first place? And the cop that was chasing, and then they said, we wasn't chasing them. And they were chasing them in an unmarked police car. But nobody asked them that question. The, another lie that they told is they said that these cops, they actually gave these cops a award and said that they were heroes because they jumped in the water and tried to save their life. But all of a sudden, you know, they could write um, articles in a paper and convince all the white people that these girls are victims and then white people could stand in front of us and say, well, I mean, why was they in the car in the face place? And I mean, what was going on? I mean, come on now. These people said that these girls stole a car and it wasn't stolen. They, they, they said that these cops jumped in the water and tried to save their life. And now you want me to believe that the girls are the victims? I mean, the girls are the ones that should be blamed? I mean, come on now, we, it don't take us, it don't take a rocket science to figure this out. It don't take a rocket science. So I want to slow down, I just, you know, you know, Kune worn out every single time and her coming, like, you know, like, this is not, like, the easiest thing in the world to do. At all. At all. My name is Columbia, as my comrade said, and I'm from St. Louis, Ferguson, and three years ago, I joined the Uhuru movement. Um, I came into organization because Mike Brown was murdered in, in Ferguson. And I was out in the streets every day trying to figure it out. Like, why, what is going on in the world? Like, why is this happening? Why is tanks driving down my street? Why is the cops, we out here praying? Like, I was an evangelist at the time. And I was out with, you know, my church brothers and sisters, pastors, and we getting, we ducking. Uh, rubber bullets. We out here peacefully with our hands up, praying that the young people would stop looting and whatever. But all I see is young people stand and say, enough is enough, and cops shoot rubber bullets at people and call them monkeys and all the other things. This is what I seen, you know what I'm saying, regardless of what you're seeing on the news. So I was outraged and I was tired. I said, listen, we don't pray when we left. This time I'm, I'm, I'm going ready. You know what I'm saying? If they going to be at war, I'm going to be at war too. You know what I'm saying? I'm done. So my war was a poster sign. <laughs> My war was, I'm going to write, the, make this sign and say, jail the killer cop. He need to go to jail. Mm -hmm. And I go to the uh, march and I meet Chairman Amali Yeshatella and he started exposing these things and saying colonialism and he was talking about that we colonize people. And I was like, what is that? What do that mean? And I was understanding what colonialism was and being colonized. And for the first time in my whole life, everything made sense. That I knew more about Jesus in the 66 books in the Bible than I ever knew about Marcus Garvey or anything in the world. And 
For once, my mama, her tears and just feeling like, you know, mama, I seen you pray. I seen you take us to church. I seen you teach us scripture. I seen you sit at the table and teach me and my brothers right and wrong. I know what kind of mother you are. And you still had to bury two sons. Like, I don't get it. Like, what kind of, I mean, I can't be more super Christian than you have been in my life. You know what I'm saying? What is this? But family, I'm like, this makes sense. Like, I get it now. Because I, the reason why I became a Christian is because I wanted to change my community. I was tired of African boys going to jail. I was tired of seeing people going through the things that they was going through, the hospitals, the schools. Ain't nothing untouched in the African's world, you know? And so I was tired and enough was enough. But explaining the world through Jesus wasn't good enough. You know what I'm saying? That was not going to change anything. And I'm not trying to convince anybody to stop being, you know, praying or reading your Bible. I'm just saying, can you read the part of the scripture where it says faith without works is dead? Can you please read the part of the scripture when Jesus said that if you do not hate yourself, hate your sister, hate your brother, then you cannot be my disciple? Saying that you have to hate this system? That's what he was talking about. You know, like, can you please read those things? Because if your Jesus or your God is not a liberating one, then I don't know what you're doing. I don't know how can a perfect God be okay with the blood that is on this country hands. And so, you know, these three girls, babies, 15 and 16 years old, when they pulled them out the river and out that car, their hands had, they had, they was holding hands, they had to pry their hands apart. They had to pry these babies' hands apart because they was holding hands the time as they scream and beg. One of their bodies was hanging out the window like she, she could have escaped and got out, but she couldn't bring her friends with her, so she was outside of the window. These cops, 17 cops, in each cop car, they have two devices that they can use to jump in the water and save their life. They chose not to do that that night. They stood there. The, the um, helicopter in front caught them saying, no, nah, they ain't dead. I still hear one of them crying. I can hear them. And then finally, a little while later, they said, yeah, they dead now. That's what they were doing as they stood out there. They made them drown. We won't back down. The reason why this tour is so important is because we need every single one of you to not just be emotional, but I need you to dig deep and say, I must organize to fight against this. The reason why this case is so important, because I... You know, since I've been organizing because I was from Ferguson, you know, they, they put the spotlight on Ferguson. So if you wanted to become a celebrity, you know, it was a perfect time. But I, I just wanted to be part of the solution. I didn't care about anything. I never signed up and said to put me on front of nobody camera or anything. I wanted something. I was tired. My mom had sat on that front pool twice. I had two dead brothers. I had one brother that got locked up at 17. I was hurt. And I wanted a solution. And I wanted to stop this stuff. I was tired. Tired. And in Ferguson, they had the spotlight. So I met a lot of families. I met probably every family that were, uh, that you heard of. I, you know, all of them. And because, you know, you know Mike Brown, um, Trayvon Morton, um, you know, all the families, I met them. I sat in front of these rooms um, with these people and everything. And I'm gonna tell you that they exploited. These families are exploited. Because nobody, like when you lose your child and you never had a theory of your own, a people who don't have a theory, they tend to boil somebody else's. So these families died. Only thing they had was displaying the world is Jesus and all these other things. So they get in front, they give them the camera, and then activists and neo-colonial puppets say, apologize, you remember your son did sell drugs one time or he did hit that one teacher, or he had a fight, or you know he was selling you know, um, single cigarettes, so he was doing something bad. So they get on the TV and they apologize, and I'm sorry, and they get a little angry, but then they say, I'm sorry for being angry, I shouldn't have did that, because they scare them and tell them that you know, you're not gonna win your case that way. This is what happened to the families. This is what happened to the families. So, and then we say, well, we gotta hear the families, because if the families say, let's get it, then we'll get it. You know, like if the family say jump off, then we gonna jump off. You know what I'm saying? We wait. Um, the family said be peaceful. 
You know what I'm saying? The family say, don't do this. The family said, walk down the street. The family say, but the families do not have a blueprint or a theory of their own, so they tend to borrow from somebody else. So somebody else is controlling our narrative. You know what I'm saying? The white left dumped money into Ferguson. Not All their money pushes an agenda. They had a reason why they dumped money in Ferguson. And it was not for us. It was not for us. Okay? And the thing about it is, the reason why this um, campaign is important is because it's being led by the African People's Socialist Party that has a theory that speaks to our deliverance, freedom. It derives us all the way to Uhuru. It says one Africa, one nation, exactly how we gonna get there, it has a to what end. And Kunde, we were fighting for Kunde case before we even met her. I so happened to be, when her, when her daughter was murdered, I so happened to be in St. Pete. It's a video that went viral that a lot of people probably seen with me and my comrade Ghazi, um, where we was at a store because some um, person had called one of our sisters a, you know, a B word. And so we went to the store and told him basically he can't have, he ain't gonna have this store no more until he apologized. And he write, you know, and buy an article and he was telling us like, you crazy. And we ran the, the pigs up off the lot, you know, and this video went viral. And it wasn't no trick cameras or anything. Like we didn't, like we, we didn't, you know, like this lady came into the Hoover house, told us our story and we had a summation with the chairman. He told us, he broke it all down and we went there and we told the man what was gonna happen. And um, after that, we found out that um, these three girls died. And Conrad Gazi said, we gotta do something. And we, I said, cause I'm from Fergus, I said, well shoot, you know, I don't know about these families. Let's do it without the family because you know, they always get picked up by Black Lives Matter and things like that. And, you know, they just change the narrative. And Gazi said, well, we're going to try to reach out to the family, you know, but we're going to organize uh, action. And so we organized the action for these girls. And then we, wa we watched the news and we seen Kunde. I mean, this fierce lady she had on her uniform, had just got off from work. They having a press conference and they standing there with the, the puppets from Black Lives Matter. And they telling this whole wash down story, and she storms the stage and say, "You're lying! Y'all lying!" And we was like, "Dang, who is that mama?" Like, yes, yes. And she was like, "These speech lessons, you need to do it like this." And she like, "Forget all y'all. You know what I'm saying? I'm not. No, they took my baby. They killed my baby. Hell no. Nah. That's exactly what it is." And um, you know, Kunde, we met Kunde, and not only did she appreciate us for doing the action that we did and the press conference and everything that we did around the three girls. She said, that's not enough. I gotta be a member of this. I need to sit, I need to be humble. I gotta sit beyond my pain. And this is the, the first year of her child's death. She picked herself out of bed. She still have kids that she had to feed because she's a single mother. And she have um, five kids. And she had to take care of them and she going to work. But every single day I seen this lady come to Cadre Development School, where we had to, you know, come early in the morning and go through training and learn all these different things, learning how to see the world. And every single day, this mother came and sat there. She passed off flyers, she knocked on doors, she sold spirits, she led workshops, and she learned and she studied just like me. And I'm looking at her like, you know, like, I seen my mama not being able to get up out the bed. But not only do you get out the bed, but you are understanding the whole world in a different way. Like, this is amazing. And that's why Kunde and this story and these three girls have to be a blueprint to all of us. And this is why we have to take this campaign, join this campaign, raise the legal fees because we have to raise the money. You know what I'm saying? They're not going to, we have to get this in the court. It costs a lot of money to even file the case. You know, it takes a lot of money to even file the case. And it takes a lot of money for us to get the evidence that they've been trying to hide. Like every time we try to get another, we got our own lawyer, which is in um, Aaron O'Neill, which is a part of the African People's Socialist Party. We handling everything. They don't know what they, if you have been watching this case, they have not had to deal with people like us. They have always had to deal with neo-colonial puppets. But th not this time, not this time. We know what they did and we won't back down. We know what they did and we won't back down. But it's gonna take you too. It's gonna take you. Nobody can just sit on the front line and say, I'm so sorry for that and I just hate this happened. And 
you know, um, I had one sister say, well, you know, that's why when my kids leave, I anoint their head. I said, well, Kunde anointed her kid too. You know what I'm saying? What do you mean? Like, all of us do that. But the fact of the matter, I have two beautiful daughters right now. Until I overturn this system, I live knowing that my child can just be playing at a playground and get shot down. And I have to go into these people's courts and try to make them understand what I'm saying. So that's why I know that until imperialism is dead, buried, and in its grave, that we are not free. We are not free, and we have to continue to fight. Fight like hell. But this right here is a blueprint. This is a blueprint. This case is a blueprint to show the world. Because them other families, they don't want to be saying that stuff. They hurt. Them they kids. Them they babies. But when you don't have no other, when you don't think you have another option, or you feel like that this is the only story that I can say, then that's 10 what you do. But we're going to give them a new story. Yes. And we're going to give them a new narrative. Yes. And that's Kunde. Yes. So I just really want to appreciate you for listening. You know, please get, you know, the brochure and educate yourself on this. And please sign up and join this campaign. And figure, I mean, until, you know, all of us got to. Because your child or the kids in your family or every generation is going to be passed the same stuff that you was passed. And it's nothing that you can teach your child that is going to escape them from this hell that African people live in. It's two Americas. It's two Americas. It's two Americas that we live in. Bottom line. White people do not even understand. Some of them, it just flabbergasts me that some of them have never even been pulled over before. Like they don't even know what that means to get pulled over. But I know too well how my heart beat and wondering, is this the time that I'm going to take my last breath yes. when they're behind me? Yes. Sandra Bland. Yes. You know what I'm saying? Yes. It's too many times. They don't drag me through a police station and I had a baby yes. premature and nobody went to jail. They hushed me up and I went out there in Ferguson and told them about what they did to me. Comrades and brothers and sisters, it's harvest time. Why do I say it's harvest time? In harvest time, it means it's time to reap. You know what I'm saying? It means for black power, August night when Mike Brown died, the consciousness of Africans is up on the rise. So right now, it's harvest time. We have to gather our people up, get them ready, because and organize and organize, not mobilize, but organize our people. Organize our people. But this is a celebration that's great. When it's harvest time, we did dances in Africa because it was harvest time. But the thing about harvest time is that means it's work. Yeah. Because if you don't move on your harvest, you will lose it. Yeah. So we got to move yeah. all over this harvest season. Mm -hmm. Touch one, 